Our next speaker is going to be <clears throat> Tim Kennerson. His presentation uh, will be talking about AIT Composites successful deployments, the GRs and the G-Beam. Uh, Tim's Vice President of Engineering at AIT Composites. He's a Maine native. He grew up just outside of Bangor, got his bachelor's degree in civil and environmental engineering from UMaine in 2012, after which he joined AIT as a design engineer. He was promoted to senior design engineer in 2018 and became vice president of engineering in 2021. Good job, Tim. He oversees a team of engineers who designed the G Arch Composite Arch Bridge System as well as the G Beam. He's a licensed PE in Maine and Rhode Island and a member of the Maine section of ASCE. So, Tim. All right. So, I'm going to pick up where Joel left off and go into a little bit more detail on the, the structure applications. And I'll focus in on uh, two that he mentioned, which was the G-Arch composite arch bridge system and the G-Beam composite tub girder bridge system, which hopefully you saw kind of a mock-up version of that as you entered uh, the facility down outside underneath the tents. There's kind of a, a visual representation of what the components look like in, in the real world. So quick overview, we're just gonna, I'm gonna go kind of briefly on what, what are the systems, kind of what are the components of them, uh, touch on where they installed, and then I'm gonna go through five um, successful deployments. They're all successful deployments. Everyone that we've put in the ground is still in the ground and still servicing their community. Uh, but these five had a, a particular uh, beneficial application using uh, the composite technology. And I'll kind of highlight those as we go through each project. So, Composite Arch Bridge System, kind of what are the applications? Well, it's targeted for 30 to 80 foot span range. Obviously it's an arch system, so you need to have the clearance to be able to put an arch in there. Typically we do rises to spans anywhere from low rise, kind of a 15% to a semicircle, you know, 50% rise to span. Main, one of the main advantages is the lightweight materials. Um, a hollow arch, is typically in the range of 200 to 350 pounds, maybe 400 if it's a longer span. Um, deck panels are about seven pounds per foot. So if you've got a 40 foot uh, wide bridge, then you're looking at a 200, 250 pound FRP deck panel. So this can all be built with an excavator or small you know, lightweight equipment in the field. Um, really great for remote applications as well. If you've got a, a difficult to uh, access site, um, the lightweight certainly is a benefit. Obviously, the, the benefits of composites in general, that they're lightweight, durable, low maintenance, extend the sur service life. Um, the composite arch bridge system does have an accompanying ASHTO guide specification, uh, an LRFD guide spec for design of CFFTs. So that assists with uh, design engineers, uh, consultant engineers across the country can now load rate this structure. Um, it's, it's a you know, guide spec that anybody can follow to understand the design and the load rating of the structure type. Um, and mitered ends, that's kind of the last uh, bullet point there. You can see an example of that. This was a project in, in Northeastern Pennsylvania for a liquid natural gas facility. Um, they wanted to eliminate the head walls. And so we essentially sloped the fill and cut it similar to how you would do uh, kind of a, a middle culvert. Um, so a lot of customizable options within the system as a whole. Uh, the, the bottom right is a, a entrance to uh, Fort Myers Air, Air, Airport down in um, across from the Red Sox training facility. So there's a nice uh, new entrance to the Skyplex Boulevard, um, Fort Myers Airport. And then as Joe had mentioned, the composite tub girder system, this is really targeted for uh, competing in that next beam span range, 30 to 100 feet, 120 feet. Um, again, the lightweight materials is a is major advantage. Um, the picture you see on the top right is, is grist mill. I know you've probably seen many pictures of grist mill and examples. Uh, that was a 75 foot span. Uh, each beam weighed about 9,000 pounds and it's hollow on the inside. There's no, no concrete infill or foam infill. Um, because of that lightweight, the contractor was actually able to pair up the outside pairs of beams with the utility supports and hoist the utilities utility cross-section uh, supports and both beams at the same time in one pick. So they reduced their, their number of picks uh, from five beams to three picks um, and gave them the ability to install utilities on the ground before lifting into place. So it's another major benefit of utilizing a lightweight technology. Uh, obviously the same, same materials here, so same durability, same you know, long lasting and low maintenance. 
uh, major advantage would be not really limited by skew. So we're not pre-stressing anything here. So we're not introducing kind of torsional forces like you might in some pre-stressing applications. Um, so we, we can do designs, you know, really with no skew restraint. Obviously beneficial in, in coastal environments where the, the superstructure elements are non-corrosive. So we can use a stainless steel shear connector um, and then everything that's in the, from the superstructure is a non-corrosive element. We are uh, also in development of a guide specification, kind of uh, similar to the CFFT guide specification so that these structures can also be designed and low rated by design professionals throughout the United States. As far as the installations, this is kind of just a br brief map of uh, where projects are located. Um, if you think about kind of where, where would you put a longer lasting, um, you know, non-corrosive, non structure, it's going to be in the northern states where we use road salts or the coastal states where you have uh, access to seawater. And uh, so we've done a little over 35 projects, primarily concentrated in Maine. We have the most number in Maine are 16 total projects. Uh, that includes bridges and uh, other ancillary structure. Like we have a snowmobile bridge. We have the trench covers that uh, Joe mentioned for Eastport. Um, and then mostly, so all, all of the New England states have at least one and then we've branched out a little bit into you know, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Florida. Uh, we just recently completed an arch bridge in Northwestern Arizona. And uh, I'll detail the one that we did in Washington a few years back as well. And we do have one international uh, down on the island of Trinidad and Tobago that we did probably about 10 years ago um, as well. So now we'll kind of go into more detail with the particular projects. I'll start with the arch bridges. Um, this particular uh, bridge was the Edmonds Township main um, structure. One of the major advantages here was being able to skew the arch bridge system. If you're looking at a kind of a traditional um, precast concrete buried arch structure, you typically have a square structure that you're placing at a skew. And so you have an kind of an overextension of your, your bridge width to accommodate the skew. Uh, in this case, that would have interfered with the existing structure. And as you can kind of see on the top, on the left picture, the top, the existing structure goes on to the north. The proposed structure uh, was going to be kind of outlined there. And so there was interference up there on that northwestern corner. And it would have necessitated essentially a phased construction, building one half of the structure, uh, transferring traffic over, demoing the existing structure, and then building the second half. Uh, in our case, we could skew that that structure and build it adjacent to the existing structure, maintaining traffic over Route 1, then transferring traffic when it was all said and done and demoing. Um, so it eliminated the phase construction uh, and eliminated a lot of the, the uh, disturbance to the natural stream bank. Um, so that it ended up saving about 50% on the, the total cost of the project and accelerated the construction because we were able to take away the phasing. So that's an example where the SKU, you know, certainly benefited the project as a whole. Now this is the Louts uh, Fish Passage, uh, Duval, Washington. This is part of the injunction, court injunction that's on Washington State DOT. They have about, I think, 800 structures that uh, between now and 2030 have to be uh, replaced to increase the spawning and rearing um, for native fish species upstream. And this was one of those structures. Um, they, I think they have about 300 structures remaining over the next seven years that they need to replace. Um, the, pre the previous structure here was a five foot diameter reinforced concrete pipe, um, which actually drained into a drainage pool and there was not access upstream um, because of the drop in um, the outflow of the pipe. And that opened up about three miles worth of spawning and rearing ground by replacing this structure. One of the unique um, things with Washington State is uh, the fault zones. And so you have to now design around the earthquakes. This particular site was within three and a half miles of three active seismic fault zones. So it certainly presented a new challenge for something that we didn't deal with on the East Coast. Um, we had to design to uh, a magnitude seven earthquake with some pretty moderate peak ground accelerations. Um, we essentially had to follow the National Highway Institute's technical manual for road and tunnel design, um, which has a 
uh, free field ground motion design criteria. So this structure was checked for racking and ovaling uh, of the structure about a, a one inch uh, free from ground, ground motion during a seismic event. So, you know, not only is it a, a durable system and has the advantages for skew and lightweight, um, but flexible enough to accommodate earthquake loading and really no difference in the design. It was actually not a, the controlling uh, load scenario. And the entire structure was, was completed in about 34 days. Um, I think our portion of that install was only six. Um, it consists of 12 15 inch diameter tubes uh, with the FRP decking. It's, it's uh, obviously opened up quite a bit. If you remember the previous structure was a five foot diameter culvert. We've gone to a 50 foot diameter stream. We can recreate a natural stream bank and uh, they planted logs and root wads uh, to encourage spawning and rearing and natural vegetation as well. One of the uh, unique challenges here was the the rise of the arch, the total rise of the arch embedded in the foundation all the way to the apex was about 18 and a half feet, which makes it really difficult to transport from Maine to Washington state. So we ended up cutting them in half and doing a splice. And you can barely see if you're looking at the apex of the arch, there's a small joint there where we have a, a field splice and uh, it, it went it went great. It was, it was a really uh, easy project. First one in Washington state, um, they, enjoyed the process so much that after that first project, they added the composite arch bridge system into their uh, Washington DOT general special provisions. So now this is an allowed alternative to any of their buried structure products um, throughout the state. Uh, twin bridge, this was, uh, we'll switch over to the composite tub girder system. This was the uh, second installation of uh, the successful deployment of the composite tub girder system. This is, as Joe mentioned, the kind of the tub girder uh, PBU or competing against the next beam prefabricated bridge unit. This uh, particular design was a six girder, three PBU. Um, so we did it with a four inch partial depth precast concrete deck. Uh, each unit had two, two girders. It's a 53 foot span with a 15 degree skew and it's two, just a two lane road, um, does have a horizontal curve and a sag curve. Uh, so some somewhat complex geometry to be using prefabricated bridge units, but we ended up doing a cast and full cast in place deck on top so we could uh, get grade with Bidwell. Uh, this was field load tested and instrumented by the University of Maine uh, just a couple months ago. So there should be some, some data on the live load performance, um, which I, presume is all good. I'm going to look at Bill. Um, this, this used, uh, as Joe mentioned, kind of the standard DOT approach with straight GFRP um, rebar in the deck with bent stainless um, for the cast in place. And it did include an integral wearing surface. So there's actually a total of 13 inches of concrete on the structure between the precast, the cast in place and the integral wearing surface. So it's pretty, pretty stout bridge for a 53 foot span, but demonstrated the use of uh, prefabricated bridge units with composite bridge technology. And here you can just see a couple pictures of uh, the installation. So this was a, an edge PBU uh, being swung in. You can see the back you know, end diaphragm is um, precast in with some closure pores and the deck itself is, has got a butt joint. So it's uh, along the span, it's, it's adjoining, but there's pockets at the abutment to tie those end diaphragms together with the cast in place bore. And there's kind of the side profile of the finished structure um, during a relatively high flow event uh, earlier this spring. Uh, then we'll move on to a structure that we did in Rhode Island. This is the Cottrell Bridge in Westerly, Rhode Island. This was Rhode Island's first use of the composite tub girder system. Very similar configuration to uh, the Twin Bridge in that it was six FRP girders three PBUs. A uh, major difference here was that they went with a full depth cast, uh, full depth precast cast, uh, full depth PBU. So we did a full eight inch um, precast concrete deck and allowed it for a two foot closure pour uh, between PBUs and, uh, and in the end diaphragm. They did kind of a unique, um, what I would consider a unique abutment detail. You can see in this picture that they had a bond out in the center PBU. So they didn't have cheek walls on the structure for lateral restraint. There was actually a center keeper block uh, that provided um, restraint. This was only a 38 foot span uh, to, to a 12 foot travel lane structure. Uh, each of these PBUs was only about 52,000 pounds. So 
stay stay below you know legal limits for shipping um, and within the the standard uh, crane equipment lifting that would be on site. This was instrumented and field load tested by uh, Bridge Diagnostics uh, BDI in September 2022, and uh, showed pretty remarkable um, data. They they didn't do a full a full load test quite like we've done on on uh, Grist Mill or or Twin Bridge in the past. This was just a single fully loaded dump truck, um, but it did validate the design assumptions and the live load. Um, distribution factors that were used in design. This was also a full uh, stainless steel rebar uh, in the precast deck with a membrane and an HMA wearing, wearing surface. Just a couple of other pictures. Um, you see utilities through that end diaphragm, kind of the intentionally roughened surface or exposed aggregate on the cast in place closure pore joints. Uh, these, this was cast with the cross slope um, formed into the PBUs. And then they just did a, a cast in place parapet on both edges. And that's just an example of the closure pour, just gets underformed and backformed and cast in place. And last structural highlight was uh, Sun Island Bridge that we did down in South Pasadena, Florida. We actually only did the center two spans out of a uh, eight span bridge. It was originally constructed in 1970 and showed pretty significant signs of deterioration in the early 2000s. Um, they went in and, and did a strengthening on this with carbon fiber. Um, even that started to fail, primarily because the two center uh, spans were used as navigable channels. So you'd get boating and jet skis that would run under and directly spray the salt water on the underside of the structure. And so you saw quite a bit of corrosion just on those spans. The adjacent spans actually were in pretty good condition. Uh, so we, we uh, were proposed kind of next to a couple of different uh, alternatives for the private owner. Uh, it runs to a homeowners association essentially on the island. And there's a lot going on in this slide, but basically there were three options that were presented. Replace it with the same material that was there, plain carbon pre-stressed slab beams. Replace it with carbon um, stainless steel pre-stressed slab beams, or replace it with a composite tub girder system. And each, each bidder bid all three options. And when you factor in the, the life cycle cost, we assumed that carbon steel would only last as long as it did before. The stainless steel and the composite tub girder were both assumed to serve a hundred year service life and need replacement at the end of that hundred years. And when you factor in uh, life cycle cost, the maintenance cost, uh, it, it kind of proved out that uh, the composite tub girder was gonna provide the lowest life cycle cost alternative. And, the homeowners association chose to uh, go with the composite tub girder. The graph on the right is actually part of a study that was done by a graduate student at Villanova University comparing the, um, the different exposure conditions of the three alternatives and showing kind of the, um, you know, ozone depletion and ecotoxicity effects of all of these different options. Um, the, the purple outside line is the plain carbon, the blue is the stainless steel. And then the green was the composite alternative. And so it kind of shows, you know, if you're looking at sustainability, what are the different, uh, you know, factors with global warming and acidification, eutrophication, those types of things. And it proved that we're, you know, on par with a stainless steel alternative and, and kind of in different particular reasons. But, uh, one of the unique things was being able to ship all of the girders for those two spans on one truck from Maine to Florida. So we put all, it was a single lane bridge. So there's four girders per span, put all eight girders on one truck and shipped it down to a plant to be precast on top of. And there you can see those two center spans replaced um, with the PBUs. They just did a cast in place uh, parapet to match the existing. And that's it.